الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين no, we've, we've really been blessed these last few nights we had Sheikh Abdul Nasser and then we had Mufti Abdul Wahab and today we have our, uh, our dear friend Sheikh Yasir Qadi from Epic across the, across I thought, the river. I thought it was Yasir Burjas. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I forgot to introduce the guest of honor, Sheikh Yasir Burjas, uh, of course, mashallah. Uh, YQ, you didn't get the dress, uh, the memo about the dress no, code, I did, did you? not get any. any yeah. You guys actually send memos about dressing? No, I yeah. didn't know. Where's, where's your vest, Yasir Bai? What's going on? Really, you're supposed to have a vest You're supposed to have a vest in this program. Nobody told me? Okay. All Plus, right, I, so I don't really have If someone have a vest. can please get him a vest and a topi? No, 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 no. no <laughs> stop. I don't have vests anymore or topis or not long time ago. That's old school. I'm, this is the. So, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, we're, we're going to continue this uh, halal meat discussion that you guys had like 20 years ago 20 on YouTube years because ago. we still haven't figured it out as a community. So. Alhamdulillah. Uh, please continue the discussion on, on Haram. <laughs> Next time, inshallah. Next time. Uh, on a serious note, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, uh, you know, uh, the blessing of going to Epic recently as well, Sheikh Yasser Zalallah Khair, uh, told me to speak about shukur. So to reward you and, and out of gratitude to you, I let you sit next to Sheikh Yasser Burjas mashallah, mashallah. As, as a reward. But no, we, we, we're, we're, great. We're, we're very grateful to you for being here, Sheikh, and we're happy to have you. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin. And it's a topic, it's a deep, deep, deep topic. So just before I introduce the topic, uh, briefly, inshallah, we'll do a line by line quick read of it. Um, you know, subhanAllah, when I was putting together the Judgment Day series, uh, I knew right away that the topic of unanswered du'as that show up on the Day of Judgment is the most important thing to so many different people because this could be the crisis of a person's faith. And we were talking about Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'an, how vulnerable he is in his writing. And this is actually one of his most vulnerable chapters. Uh, so inshallah ta'ala we'll, we'll start Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala Fayaqulu rahimahullah ta'ala He says, uh, speaking about the, the, uh, the delay of dua Qala ra'aytu min al-bala' al-ujab Anna al-mu'min yad'u fala yujab Fayukarriru dua wa tatulu al-mudda Wala yara atharan al-ijaba He said that I saw that from the tests Is that a believer makes dua and the supplication is not answered. So he continues to repeat the dua, and the time continues to go on, and he sees no impact, no effect of that dua. So he needs to know that this is one of the tests that requires patience. And the sickness that needs to be cured is not the answer to the du'a, the delay in the answer to the du'a, but rather the waswasa, the whispers that come into a person's mind when the du'a starts to be delayed for a very long time. So he continues on, and this is very beautiful. He says, وَلَقَدْ عَرَضَ لِي مِنْ هَذَا الْجِنْسِ He says, by the way, I suffered from something like this, so I went through something like this. فَإِنَّهُ نَزَلَتْ بِي نَازِلَ فَدَعَوْتُ وَبَالَغْتُ فَلَمْ أَرَ الْإِجَابَ فَأَخَذَ إِبْلِيسُ يَجُولُ فِي حَلَبَاتِ كَيْدِهِ he said that I went through this myself and I kept on making dua and I kept on exerting myself in the supplication. And then Iblis came to me and he started to use his tricks. فَتَارَةً يَقُولُ الْكَرْمُ وَاسِعْ وَالْبُخْلُ مَعْدُومُ فَمَا فَائِدَةُ تَأْخِيرِ الْجَوَابِ He said, so he, he says to me, you know, if Allah has all that he has, if his generosity is limitless, and if al-bukhl, if deficiency cannot be attributed to him, if, he, if he's never stingy, then why is he delaying the answer to your dua? So this is Iblis, Shaytan talking to him. <clears throat> so I told him, go away, O accursed one. I don't want you as an advisor, nor, am I, nor do I put my trust in you. You're not the one that's going to help me solve this problem. So I told Iblis, go away. And then he says, He said, then I went back to my nafs. So now I'm having a conversation with myself. فَقُلْتُ إِيَّاكِ وَمُسَاكَنَةَ وَسْوَسَتِهِ فَإِنَّهُ لَوْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي تَأْخِيرِ الْإِجَابَةَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَبْلُوَكَ الْمُقَدِّرُ فِي مُحَارَبَةِ الْعَدُوْ لَكَفَى فِي الْحِكْمَةِ He said, I went back to my nafs and I told myself, beware, beware of letting the effect of that whisper of Iblis that he just put inside of you stay with you. For verily, if the only thing that comes out of this trial of yours 
of the delay of the dua is that you go to war with the shaitan, then that is enough of a wisdom in and of itself. That it puts you at war with the shaitan and it helps you overcome the enemy. قالت فسلني فسلني عن تأخير الإجابة في مثل هذه النازلة. So the, the, my soul said back to me, myself said back to me, my nafs said, then you know, help me get through this. Help me understand the wisdom of this. Take me on a journey with this delay. And obviously I'm paraphrasing and I'm not reading the translation because honestly it was, it was awful. Uh, فقلت قد ثبت بالبرهان أن الله عز وجل مالك وللمالك التصرف بالمنع والعطاء فلا وجه للاعتراض عليه. He said that I'm talking to my nafs now and I said it has been proven already we know through divine revelation that Allah is the king and the king forbids and the king gives and there is no way for you, no route for you to dispute with the king about what the king withholds and what the king gives. والثاني أنه قد ثبتت حكمته بالأدلة القاطعة فربما رأيت الشيء مصلحة والحكمة لا تقتطيه وقد يخفى وجه الحكمة فيما يفعله الطبيب من أشياء تؤذي في الظاهر يقصد بها المصلحة he said, and, and, and it's already been proven as well, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wisdom that is beyond anything that we can encompass. And just like, so not everything has to have a clear wisdom to it, meaning you trust the wise, and we're going to go into detail with each of these, but you trust the most wise, you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has that wisdom. And so sometimes you're not going to be able to see the wisdom of every single thing, just like the doctor with the patient, Sometimes the doctor does things that the patient doesn't quite understand, but at the end of the day, it's actually to the patient's benefit. So it might be that this is from that. So that's the second possibility. والثالث, and the third thing. أنه قد يكون تأخير مصلحة والاستعجال مضرة وقد قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يزال العبد بخير ما لم يستعجل يقول دعوت فلم يستجب لي. So the third thing, possibility, is that it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delaying it for you is actually to your benefit. And had he hastened the answer for you, then it would actually be to your harm. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that a slave of Allah is in, 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 good, in, in, in a good place until they say, I made dua and it was not answered. So Allah will continue to answer the dua of his slave until the slave says, I made dua and it was not answered. والرابع and the fourth thing أنه قد يكون امتناع الإجابة لآفة فيك فربما يكون في مأكلك شبهة أو قلبك وقت الدعاء في غفلة أو تزاد عقوبتك في منع حاجتك لذنب ما صدقت في التوبة منه So he says the fourth possibility is that it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is holding it back because of something within you something within you So perhaps there is a shubha, there is something doubtful in your food. So there's some haram in your sustenance, right? In your earning, in your worldly earning. Or your heart at the time of dua is heedless. Or you are being increased in punishment because of a sin that you have not sincerely repented for yet. There is an outstanding sin that you have yet to sincerely make tawbah for. فابحثي عن بعض هذه الأسباب لعلك تقعي بالمقصود. So look for the answers in this regard so that perhaps you will find out the reason. Then he goes into some uh, stories. He says كما روي عن أبي يزيد رضي الله تعالى عنه أن نزل أنه نزل بعض الأعاجم في داره فجاء فرآه فوقف بباب الدار وأمر بعض أصحابه فدخل فقلع طينا جديدا قد طينه فقام الأعجمي وخرج فسئل أبو يزيد عن ذلك فقال هذا طين من وجه فيه شبهة فلما زالت الشبهة زال صاحبها Actually this one I'm going to want some explanation from both of you inshallah ta'ala but it seems like what he's saying is that there was a group of people from outside that were in his home and it seems to be some sort of hostility in them being in his home, correct? And so he removes something from the outside so there are people from the outside that are in his house, some hostility. Allahu alam, I'll, I'll let sh the Sheikh Yasser's talk about I, I, it. I think what he, what he mentions over here basically, he was like tried by some people taking over his house. Right. So he removed that something, he felt there was shubha in the, right. uh, in the kind of like construction of his own house. Right. So he removed that, Allah removed that, the, the bala for him. Yeah. SubhanAllah. So he says he removed that there were some people that took over his house and he removed a brick from the outside that was new 
And when it was taken away, the people left the house. And he said the shubha, the doubtful thing, was removed. Therefore, the companion or the, uh, the hostility was removed as well. وعن إبراهيم الخواص رحمة الله عليه أنه خرج لإنكار منكر فنبحه كلب له فمنعه أن يمضي فعاد ودخل المسجد وصلى ثم خرج فبصبص الكلب له فمضى وأنكر فزال المنكر فسئل عن تلك الحال فقال كان عندي منكر فمنعني, فمنعني الكلب فلما عدت تبت من ذلك فكان ما رأيتم So Ibrahim al-Khawas was one of the tabi' tabi'in I believe third generation Muslim, uh, known for his asceticism and, and, and uh, tasawwuf in that regard, he went out to correct some people, to forbid an evil. So he's going out to stop someone from doing something wrong or to correct an evil. And a dog stops him and starts to bark at him. So he says, I went back to the masjid and I prayed two rak'ahs and I made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then I went back out and the dog was submissive to me you know, wagging its tail and opening the way for me and so I went and I corrected those people and when he was asked about that he said that I had an evil myself I had a sin that I had committed myself and once I, and so the dog forbade me but once I uh, went back to Allah and made tawbah then that's, then what happened is what happened in front of you well khamis أنه ينبغي أن يقع البحث عن مقصودك بهذا المطلوب فربما كان في حصوله زيادة إثم أو تأخير عن مرتبة خير فكان المنع أصلح He says and the fifth thing is that it might be or you should look for uh, uh, some of these reasons it may be that if Allah gave you what it is that, that you're asking for then that would increase you in sin or it would delay you from a martaba, from a rank that is better for you, and so Allah forbidding you was actually better for you. وَقَدْ رُوِيَ عَنْ بَعْضِ السَّلَفِ أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَسْأَلُ اللَّهِ الْغَزْوَةِ And so it's narrated that there was a man that was one of the pious predecessors was asking Allah for the ability to go out in battle. فَهَتَفَ بِهِ هَاتِفٌ إِنَّكَ إِنْ غَزَوْتَ أُسِرْتَ وَإِنْ أُسِرْتَ تَنَصَّرْتَ SubhanAllah. So he was stopped and it was said to him, that, or it was inspired that if you were to go out, you would be captured. And if you would be captured, you would leave your religion. So it's better for you that Allah did not even let you, you know, pursue this bab, the station that you were trying to pursue of going out and fighting fi sabirillah, because Allah knows that if you were going to be captured, you would have left your religion. Was sadis, annahu rubbama kana faqtu ma tafqidinahu sababan lil wuqufi ala al bab wal وحصوله سببا للاشتغال به عن المسؤول وهذا الظاهر بدليل أنه لولا هذه النازلة ما رأيناك على على باب اللجء. It may be the sixth thing. It may be that Allah subhanahu wa taala causing you to miss what you are missing is the very reason why you are at His door and pleading. So the thing that you keep on asking Allah for and the thing you're missing is the very reason you're staying at His door and pleading with Him and begging Him. And had you gotten what you were asking for, then that would busy you from the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the proof of that is that if it wasn't for this trial, you wouldn't be making dua like this. The reason why you're in dua in the first place and you're, and you're so immersed in your supplication and concerned with your supplication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fact that you need something from Him. فَالْحَقُّ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَلِمَ مِنَ الْخَلْقِ اشْتِغَالِهِمْ بِالْبِرِّ عَنْهُ فَلَذَعَهُمْ فِي خِلَالِ النِّعَمْ بِعَوَارِضَ تَدْفَعُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَابِهِ يَسْتَغِيثُونَ بِهِ So he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows from his creation what takes them away from him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them into a situation with some tests and trials that brought them to his door. فَهَذَا مِنَ النِّعَمْ فِي طَيِّ الْبَلَاءِ this is actually a blessing in disguise of a trial or disguised as a trial to you. The trial that's been given to you then is a blessing because being at the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually a blessing. And he says that a true trial is what takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it's nice and sweet, if it takes you away from Allah, then that's what the trial is. But what causes you to stand in front of him and, 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 and before him and pleading with him, that's where you're going to find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to increase you in what is good. And this is subhanAllah such a beautiful narration he ends with here. 
وقد وقد حكي عن يحيى البكاء انه راى ربه عز وجل في المنام انا اسك يو شيخ ياسر قاضي تو كومنت اون ذات بارت يحيى البكاء uh, it was narrated that he saw his lord in a dream فقال يا رب كم ادعوك ولا تجيبني he called out to his lord in, in his dream he says ya oh, ya allah oh my lord how often do i call upon you and you don't answer me فقال يا يحيى إني أحب أن أسمع صوتك. يا الله. He said, Oh, Yahya, I love to hear your voice. إني أحب أن أسمع صوتك. I love to hear your voice. Meaning, I love to hear you in dua. وإذا تدبرت هذه الأشياء تشاغلت بما هو أنفع لك من حصول ما فاتك من رفع خلل أو اعتذار من زلل أو وقوف على الباب أو تسليم إلى رب الأرباب. And so if you take time to think about this and to contemplate and to go through the reasons of the delay of your dua, and you would, instead of trying to rush getting what you're asking Allah for, instead of being so concerned with getting the, the thing that you keep asking Allah for, instead, you would focus yourself on making that sincere repentance for the sin that might be holding you back, or busying yourself by being at the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submitting yourself to the Lord of all those who claim Lordship. SubhanAllah. So it's a long, beautiful chapter, and I apologize to the Mashaykh. I was reading through it line by line, obviously, but inshallah ta'ala, the floor is for both of you, uh, whichever one of whoever wants to start with the night time. Your, your overall comments on the chapter, then we'll go, inshallah, section by section with the night time. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa amna wa lahma ba'd. Firstly, that was very beautiful, azakumullah khair. Uh, I must confess that I didn't understand uh, the format I was here. I thought I was going to give a lecture. So I came prepared for a lecture, and now we have a sharh of, mashallah, uh, Ibn Jawzi Sayyid al Khatr, which is much better than anything I would say. Uh, FYI, um, this passage I have translated it in the book that I wrote about dua. It was a 25 years ago. I have a book about dua, the weapon of the believer. So this passage of Sayyid al Khatr is translated in chapter 8, I think, which is about the wisdom of a delayed response. So it's bil uh, ma'na, so you can read it over there, inshallah ta'ala. So to summarize, if you like, so how long do I have? I don't understand the format. This is the first, I, I apologize, I don't know the format. So what's the format? I'm going to be asking you questions. You're going to be asking questions? <laughs> okay. So tell us now your, your reflection on what you heard today. So I have, what, five, ten minutes? So that, okay, bismillah. Okay, uh, so the way we should look at this is actually slightly different than most of us typically uh, understand when we do dua. The fact is when we make dua, most of us are in one dimensional mode. What I mean by this is, there's us and there's our dua. And we just want to walk straight till our dua is given to us, okay? We need to break away from 1D and move into firstly 2D, and then inshallah break away for that to get into 3D, okay? What do I mean by all of this? Ibn Jawzi kind of summarizes some of what I'm trying to, to impart here. And that is that we need to stop being so self-centered on just the one aspect of what I'm asking for and I want it. We have to move beyond this and understand that first and foremost, look at the broader picture. And that is that there is more to making dua than getting the dua answered. There is more to the dua and there is a wisdom in making dua that is more than just you getting what you want. So two-dimensional, you begin with yourself. And you start analyzing what's up with me. Why is it that this dua is taking so long? And Ibn Jawzi references a number of these points. First and foremost, ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? What is the impediments in my way and journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You need to move beyond the selfishness of I want X. Because there is a wisdom. Allah is depriving you of X because of a greater good. So what is that greater good? What is that two-dimensional? You begin with yourself. The 2D is yourself. And that is you situate yourself in this whole paradigm. What's going on here? Am I doing something wrong? Do I have sins that are blocking my dua going up? Do I have haram rizq? Because one of the biggest impediments of dua is haram rizq, right? The Prophet gave the most eloquent example of a person dying of starvation, traveling in the middle of the desert. He's begging Allah, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. Generally, such a person would elicit compassion from Allah. Generally, you're all alone, you're wandering in the desert, you're lost, you need Allah's help. Then the Prophet added, added, but hold on a sec. 
His whole money is haram. He's eating haram, he's drinking haram, he's wearing haram. How does he even think Allah is going to respond to him? So that's a terrifying wake-up call for us. Is my is halal? What am I doing wrong in my own analysis of what's going on? Also, a lot of times we're stuck with du'as of this dunya. Oh Allah, I want this job. Oh Allah, I want this degree. And subhanAllah, this call halal is all permissible to ask Allah of this dunya. But maybe, just maybe, we have our priorities wrong. Maybe there are bigger and more important du'as we should be making. What are my priorities? Is it dunya? Is it job? Maybe the passion I'm using to get that particular job is misplaced. There are far more important things I need for myself and I'm not asking Allah for them. Hidayah, taqwa, maghfira, ilm, much more easier and guaranteed. So the two-dimensional, you analyze yourself. You see what's going on in my own life. What impediments do I have? Right? You also realize it's still in the 2D right now. We haven't got to the 3D. In the 2D, you still realize that, okay, this is a test from Allah. So there is a wisdom in this test. And Allah knows what I don't know. Remember the story of Musa and Khidr. Never forget this beautiful story. Three incidents, right? In Surah Al Kahf. Three incidents. And every one of them, you don't understand the wisdom when it's happening. Every one of them. Why is this happening? The, the, the Masakeen were generous. They allowed Musa and Khidr on the boat. And lo and behold, the boat sinks. They would think, we were generous. Why is Allah punishing us this way? Okay? In the second story, where the boy is killed. The boy is killed. And the parents are like, hold on a sec. This is what, what happened? Where out of nowhere, some mass murderer came in their perspective and killed the boy. In the third story, the orphans don't have money. And their mother is begging Allah, where's the money? I need money right now. But in all of these stories, they're only looking one dimensional. They're only looking literally one step ahead. They're not understanding it's 2D. They're not understanding Allah knows and you don't know. You might hate something and it's better for you. You might want something and it is not good for you. Remember the story in the seerah that that hypocrite promised Allah that, Oh Allah, I promise you. If you make me rich, you will see me the most generous of all people. And he kept on making dua and he boasted publicly. And then when Allah made him rich, he said, yeah, I don't need to give. Allah reminds us in Surah uh, Tawbah. Literally, Allah reminds us of this incident. There are people who they made a promise to Allah. Ya Allah, you will see. Just give me a million. Just make me wealthy. Make me the VP of this company. Make me with this person. And when you're 20 and you make all these promises, then when you get to 30, 40, and Allah has given you all those promises what happened to all of that maybe it's better that promise is not enacted maybe it's better as the hadith in Sahih Bukhari as well that the Prophet was giving money and one of the Sahaba said Ya Rasulullah why don't you give to so and so Fawallahi he's a mu'min and the Prophet ignored him second time ignored him third time the Prophet turned to him and said oh so and so sometimes I don't give money to people even though I love them because I know that that money will be a temptation for them and it's going to cause them to go astray and they're going to be dragged to hell on their faces. So I don't give them the money for their own mercy, for their own rahmah. This is the Prophet knowing the Sahaba. Imagine Walilah al Allah Azza wa knowing us. Allah knows what is a test and trial for us. Allah knows what is good for us, what isn't good for us. So that's the 2D. And again, a lot can be said here, but time is limited. What is the 3D? Where do we now go even beyond the, 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 from the 2D to the, to the 3D? The 3D here, what I mean here, is the psychology of ibadah. From concentrating on ourselves and our wants and our problems, we now move on to the psychology of ibadah. 3D, we, we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Allah and who are we? What right do I have to demand something from Allah? Have I given even partially the hukuk of Allah such that I am now demanding, I want this job, oh Allah, I don't have it? Have you given, have I given a fraction of the hukuk of Allah? What gives me the arrogance, the right, the kibr to then say back to Allah, I don't have this, why don't I have it? What have I done in the first place? Who is the Rabb and who is the Marbu? Who is the Hakim? Who is the Adnam al Khuyub? So three-dimensional, we bring in the psychology of ibadah itself. What is the purpose of dua? The dua is not just because we want X. No, three-dimensional dua is the essence of ibadah. There is no act of worship that better demonstrates ibadah than dua. No act of worship.
And that's why our Prophet said, Hadith is in Tirmidhi, Dua hu al ibadah. And also in Abu Dawud, Dua mukhu al ibadah. Dua is the quintessential aspect of worship. Why? Because nothing combines between servitude and fear and hope and love and ubudiyah than you raising your hands and begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something you need. You are implicitly, you are implicitly affirming every name and attribute of Allah. Allah is ghafoor, Allah is sami' Allah is basir, Allah is qawi, Allah is aziz, Allah knows, Allah hears, Allah loves, Allah can give you. Simply by raising your hands, you're automatically affirming all of this. You're also affirming, I can't do any of those things. That's why I'm asking you, oh Allah, I'm not Samir, I'm not Qawi, I'm not Ala Kulli Shayin Qadir. So dua is the essence of worship. There is no action, not even sajda, because we can do sajda and our minds are thinking about our workplace tomorrow, right? But you cannot do dua that you need. We're not talking about dua that is generic, like parrots memorized. No, dua that you need. Your son is sick, you're failing an exam, you need to pass it, right? Any dua that you need, and you discover the reality of iman. You discover the reality of tawheed. You discover the reality of ubudiyya. Therefore, three-dimensional, you realize, you know what? The spirit of dua is more important than the actual fulfillment of the dua. To actually be in the mindset of dua, to make dua from the qalb and the qalib, from the inner body and soul, that state, wallahi, is a bigger blessing than any dunyawi blessing that you are asking for. I want to repeat that. Any worldly blessing you're asking for, the state you will reach for a prolonged delay, and your iman is going higher and higher, and your ikhlas is going higher and higher, and your tahajjud is increasing, and your relationship with Allah is getting stronger. That state, it is more precious to you, and more needed by you, than the actual fulfillment of the dua. So if you understand 3D, and stop being so self-centered. This is me, this is my dua. No, break away from that. There are higher maqasid, there are higher goals to the dua than your minuscule, one-dimensional fulfillment of what you want. And of the highest of the maqasid is the idhar of the ubudiyyah, the manifestation of the servitude of the servant in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Ibn al-Jawzi himself says a very beautiful passage inside somewhere else um, uh, where he mentions that. Uh, and Ibn al-Qayyim also frequently says the same thing. He says, that the righteous servants, when they start making dua and it's delayed, they reach a hal, a spiritual state that is more precious to them than the fulfillment of the actual dua. And they begin to appreciate that hal so much so, listen to this, that they secretly wish that the dua is continued to be delayed because they realize that when the dua is fulfilled, they will lose that hal with Allah. This is the three-dimensional aspect of dua, where we stop being so self-centered and just think about the one aspect of, I want this, subhanAllah, life is more important than this. And your ubudiyah to Allah is the most important thing. So the three-dimensional, you bring in who is Allah? What are the names and attributes of Allah? Who exactly am I? What is my relationship with Allah? What am I supposed to be doing here? And if a delayed dua, causes you to rethink through all of this, then wallahi, your dua has not only been answered in a better manner, that is the essence of why Allah created you. I think I went overboard, so. Jazakallah khair, that's beautiful. Alhamdulillah, Rami, let's close the session right now, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, you, you gave your lecture, Shaykh. <laughs> but <laughs> seriously, Jazakallah khair, this, is, this is so beautiful to summarize, subhanAllah, the, the, the essence of what Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, was trying to convey to us, really. And if I want to focus on something, I want to go back again to two things. Uh, um, the number one thing, what you mentioned earlier about the essence of dua itself, what the Prophet says, who al ibadah. That the dua in itself is an act of worship. The dua itself is an act of worship. What does that exactly mean? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you to, to worship Him, they need to obey. What kind of worship I'm talking about here? Fasting is an act of ibadah. Praying is an act of ibadah. Reading Quran is an act of ibadah. Going for hajj is an act of ibadah. Giving zakat is an act of ibadah. Right? Now, what are you waiting for when you pray five times a day? What are you waiting for when you give your zakah? What are you waiting for when you, you, you fast and you go to hajj and so on and so on? Are you looking for any immediate reward right away? Or are you waiting for the reward to be where? In Jannah. That's what our focus is, right? How is that different? Because the dua in itself is an act of worship. It is absolute, this is something you have to believe, that your dua is answered for sure. It's 100% answered but not necessarily in a way that might be meaningful to you. It's in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees 
pleasing to you ultimately. If not in the dunya, and then the akhirah. So your duty is to make the dua, which is the ibadah itself. So I need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by making the dua. Now, expecting a specific response, that's your fault. Because Allah did not guarantee that for you. And that's the example that you mentioned about the story of Khidr and Musa. I mean, things were happening, people were not expecting. But the outcome of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused things to happen to them is way beyond their expectation. Like the example of the, of the boat, for instance. These fishermen were going to the boat and Musa alayhi salam and Al-Khidr actually, Al-Khidr made a hole in that boat. And obviously when they left, the people did not see the hole until later on. I guarantee you, these people when they saw the hole, they started maybe cursing and cussing at whoever did that to them. But then later on when they saw the barricade and uh, these boats were about to be confiscated, and then they see all these fishermen crying their eyes out on the shore. But then the soldiers come to their port and they go, no good, there's a hole in the boat, leave it. That same hole that they were cursing and cussing at the person who did it, later on, what would they say about that same hole? What a blessing. Whoever did that, thank you very much, right? In our life, we always focus on the hole. That's what we only see, the hole. What's beyond it, we don't know. Similar with the dua. We only f focus on what? The answer. But the answer is not coming. Or at least that's what you think. But the answer is already, it has been coming to you. Which is why, subhanAllah, the beautiful statement of Yahya al-Bakka when he says, Qala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he answered him, he's been asking, Ya Rabbi, my Lord, I've been making dua, where's my answer? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, you got your answer. I'm listening to you. I love listening to you. You already got your answer. I am listening to you. I'm loving it. Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves listening to you and hearing, to you, hearing you. Isn't that sufficient? Whatever you ask for, that if you get it, it might be deterred from doing whatever you could do better. But here, like Sheikh Yasser was talking about the hal, the condition, the mental, emotional, spiritual state that you are in right now, that's something beyond any worldly gain. So here, Yahya al Bakka, he got his answer. He said, look, I, I answered you already. I'm listening to you. And I love what I'm listening, what I'm hearing right now. But if I give you what you ask for, what's going to happen? You're going to stop talking to me. You're going to stop asking me. I'm going to stop listening to you. So isn't it better for you to, for me to keep listening to you than getting what you personally ask for? That's one thing. Second thing, subhanAllah, and I remind, that reminds me of the um, al-istikhara, Shaykh. Oh man, a lot of people come to me with the istikhara, Shaykh. How do I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered my istikhara? I said, look, you guys are, are taking it wrong. Al-istikhara in itself, for those who don't know what istikhara is, is when you want to make a decision about something that you're not sure about. So the son of the Prophet ﷺ, that you make wudu, and then you pray to raka, and you make dua, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if there's good in that thing, to make it easy for you. If it's not, take it away from you, and give you that which is best. So most people do istikhara for what? What is the main thing people make istikhara for a jama'ah? Marriage, right? So they make istikhara, they come to me and says, I made istikhara, so how do I know that my, 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 you know, I got my answer? I said, look, for the guys, the answer is always positive, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is with the sisters in istikhara. <laughs> she keeps saying, I'm not really sure. You know? I said, look, subhanAllah, you guys are taking it wrong. Al-istikhara is not a decision-making tool. Because what people, people think about istikhara, they make istikhara and they're waiting for an answer. There's no flying bird, there's no you know, rainbows, halal rainbows. Those but colors. Yeah. All these things, huh? Those oh, colors. These colors, yeah. mashallah. Yeah. People waiting for an answer. <laughs> well, al-istikhara is not about getting your answers, it's about you worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by delegating the affairs of your life to Him and asking Him to help you make the right decision. That's what it means. So your job is to make the ibadah. And once again, once you start making dua, your dua has been answered. Allah is hearing you. He's listening to subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does he will to answer you? That's not for you. Wallahu I want to I wanna make this uh, very... Uh, I'm going to bring both of you, inshallah ta'ala, to a place to be a little bit personal, inshallah ta'ala. Um, the fact that Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'ala, says, I had this happen to me. I've been there. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of times when the righteous feel so unrelatable. Like, I don't know what's happening, and, uh, or these people read so much Qur'an and all they do is worship Allah. But when you have one of these people, the most prolific writer in Islamic history, saying, I've been there. Like, I had to go through this long conversation with my nafs and keep the shaitan away. 
First and foremost, there's something redemptive about that, that look, that, that is gonna be a test in and of itself, that you're going to sometimes have that feeling, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, don't say, da'utu fa da'utu fa I made dua and I was not answered. That's one of the whispers that will come though. Are you sinful for the whisper? No. In fact, the ibadah, and this is the first part of this, what Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah says, the fact that you are exerting yourself, just like with any doubt that comes in your mind or in your heart, the fact that you're fighting against the doubt is in and of itself a sufficient wisdom because it strengthens you in your ultimate uh, benefit or to your ultimate, uh, f forwards you, advances you in your ultimate pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. So the fact that you, that you went through that, that you're fighting with the shaytan is in and of itself, in and of itself something very beautiful. Now as for the talab, as for the ask, Mata Atlaq Allah, Mata Atlaq Allah, Talab, Fa'lam Anahu Yuridu An Yu'atliyak, you have the saying of Ibn Ata'a Allah, Rahimullah Ta'ala, once, once Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allows your tongue to move, it's because He wants to give you something. Allah is the one who let your tongue move. Allah is the one who let you make dua. Allah is the one who gave you access to His door. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the one who gave you that direct connection. And Allah loves to hear your voice, even though, even though He doesn't need your voice. He doesn't need your existence, but Allah loves to hear your voice. And SubhanAllah, that part of the chapter honestly gives me a lot of, uh, you know, it, it takes me back to that, that, that statement of Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. Like the Prophet said to Ubay, Allah has commanded me to read Surah al Bayyinah to you. And he said, he, start, he said, Ya Rasulullah, wait, Allah named me? Samani? Allah said, read to obey? Like, you, Allah said, obey my name? <laughs> and he said, yes. And obey just broke down crying. So how is it when Allah says, I like hearing your voice. You enjoy your conversation with me at night. I enjoy my conversation with you at night. Think about that. These last 10 nights, I enjoy my conversation with you at night. And so, as we come to this, and, and I really want both of you, inshallah, and I'll, I'll try to do my part in this as well, yani, uh, see how much we can open up a bit. Um, so obviously within, within the, the, the bounds that are, that are good. But we've all been there, right? Like we've been in those moments where I'm making dua for something and it's fall, it seems to be falling apart. And we know the text, and it's one thing to know the text that Look, at the end of the day, it's not about the talab, it's about who you are requesting from, not the request that you're making, and loving to be in that relationship with him and trusting that everything's going to be given to you, but can, can both of you kind of share and as much as personal as you want to get when you've been in some of those moments where like, I'm trying to figure out like, and then later on in life it made sense, or you, know, you, you came to some realization. <clears throat> uh, so firstly, before I answer your question, um, you raised a point I wanted to, to mention, and, and you, 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 you mentioned in a passing, and I want to just harp on that a little bit more. Ibn al-Jawzi, the alama, the ocean of knowledge, one of the greatest luminaries of our entire 14 centuries, he himself was struggling, like all of us struggle. No matter how much ilm you have, you're still human. And he himself had to like, what's going on? Why isn't my dua being answered? Now, what I really loved, he opened up, because as you're doing the book, Sayyid al-Khatr, so you're aware, this is like his personal autobiography that is meant for his spiritual soul. It's a very beautiful, moving book. I love the fact that he opened up for us his own inner dimension, inner debates. You can even say an inner demon, right? And how he has to conquer that inner demon. It's human, brothers and sisters. It's human to feel these doubts and to have to go back and forth. But you have to win yourself. That's what Bill Josie does, right? So I wanted to make that point and please go back to this in Arabic or in English, wherever, and listen to this whole conversation. He has to fight his own soul and conquer his own soul. Now, who is fighting the soul? A part of his soul is fighting another part of the soul. This is the essence of internal jihad. This is what the jihad of the nafs is, where you have these doubts and issues and another part of you, the iman side, the, 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 the taslim side has to come and tame that other side down. So that's a very important point. That doesn't matter who you are. It's not a weakness of iman to go through these types of things. Ibn al-Jawzi is going through this. Now as for your question about personal anecdote, actually my dua book mentions it. I have a book called Dua, The Weapon of the Believer. It's like 24 years old now, subhanAllah. That book, not me, I'm a bit older than 24. Uh, and I write in that book, and if you don't have it, uh, please do find it online or whatever. It's uh, one of my most um, 
personally one of my favorite books that I've written, Alhamdulillah. It's a very emotional book. And FYI, it's also my most popular selling book, right? Uh, the reason I think it is the most popular selling is because I wrote it with passion. And why did I write it with passion? It was at a time of my own life where I was undergoing one of the biggest tests and trials that I have ever undergone in my life. Um, I have spoken about that in one of my library chats, so I don't want to go into the actual details here. But let's just say a very big zulm had been done to me, a very massive injustice. And my reputation slandered and, you know, um, I was going to come back and not do my master's because of a slander, because of a lie that people had said about me. Okay, so I was given a one-way visa to leave the country and to come back here. And I was marks-wise, grade-wise accepted. I was technically supposed to go to the Masters of Medina, but because of internal issues and standard stuff, that wasn't happening. I was writing this book, making dua to Allah to write the injustice done to me. So the entire summer of 2000, I remember vividly, because I got accepted in that summer. The entire summer of the year 2000, I was just doing research on dua for myself. And I was writing the book for myself. From the qalb, I want and I'm making dua. And there was a time limit on that because I had a, visit, I had a visa that was going to be, I was you know, going to leave the country. I had to be accepted by a certain date or else I'm leaving. Okay? So literally, I'm making dua and I'm writing the book of dua as I'm making dua. Hardly in my life have I done more, any yani stronger spiritual dua than in that phase. You know? And so all of these quotations and all of the book that you write, inshallah, you can feel my own spirit in it. And it was Allah's qadr. I finished the first draft, the second draft, I'm finishing up and I'm writing the introduction to finally send to the publisher. And I have a week or two left before I pack my books and leave the country. When phone call comes out of nowhere, I didn't even know the guy, complete, you know, and he goes, yani, Yaya said, Abshir, you know, your dua has been answered. And I remember clearly I fell into sajda that night and just, you know, Alhamdulillah, and it was just, a, and, and I wrote that in the introduction, you, write, you read the introduction, like, you know, the dua was answered right before, like the 11th hour, as they say. So I have seen, and there is no question if you know the whole story, for me, this is a karama, it's like a mu'j, it's not going to happen otherwise, you know, Allah intervened because of the dua, otherwise there is no way, if you know what's going on in the country, Alhamdulillah, it happened. But to be honest, there are other times when I have made dua, and I didn't get what I was asking for. That's also the case. We are all human beings. And yes, just like Ibn al-Jawzi has to struggle. Yes, you have to struggle. What's going on? Am I doing something wrong? Am I sinful? You know, does, is Allah not happy with me? Shaitan comes and tells you this, you know? And you have to remind yourself, well firstly, we always have a constant journey to Allah, but secondly, and I, I need to make this point, not having your dua answered the way you want it to be answered is not a sign that you're an evil person, you're a loser, you're a failure. No, because first and foremost, as both of the Mashayikh have said, Josie says before him, we have to get rid of this mentality, my dua wasn't answered. No, it was answered. Your dua is guaranteed to be answered. Your dua is guaranteed. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ الشرط وَجَوَابُ الشرط. This is a conditional clause in Arabic. This is a conditional clause. You do X, you will get Y. Allah has a conditional clause about dua. Your Lord has announced to mankind, أُدْعُونِي You make dua to me. أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ I shall respond to you. This is a clause and the answer to that clause. Guaranteed response. The Prophet ﷺ said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ Your du'as will be responded to. End of story. Period. You should not doubt your du'as responded to. Unfortunately, we're in the one-dimensional mind. We think the response is to get what I want. No. Perhaps Allah gave you something better. You didn't even realize it. Perhaps Allah averted a calamity. You didn't even realize it. Perhaps Allah will reward you on the day of judgment and what you will get is infinitely better than your meager job that you wanted and you were making dua for. So Allah has responded. Stop thinking Allah hasn't responded. That's point number one. You shall be responded to. Don't stop making dua. Point number two. If the Prophet himself can make dua and Allah says, no, I'm not going to give you that. Then how about me and you? Even the du'as of the Prophet not all of them were given. Hadith is in Abu Dawud and Muslim Ahmad and others. The Prophet said, دعوت ربي ثلاثا فأعطاني اثنين ومنعني واحد. It's explicit hadith. I made du'a to Allah for three things. 
He gave me two of them and he denied me one, subhanAllah. Denial does not mean that your rank is low, a'udhu billah. Allah has a higher plan than you. By the way, what, what were these three? Three, three? These three things. Number one, that my ummah shall not be destroyed by a natural calamity. I don't want my ummah to be destroyed by natural calamity. So never shall the entire ummah be destroyed by because some of the previous nations were destroyed, like this way. Number two, no foreign nation, no foreign civilization will come and conquer them completely. Yes, portions can be conquered. Colonization conquered 80%. But the ummah is never going to be conquered 100%. And Allah gave him that dua. What was the third that he didn't give him? The Prophet made dua, Ya Rabb, let there be no inner fighting amongst my ummah. And for a wisdom known to Allah, Allah said, no, I'm not going to give you this. So we have civil wars from the time of the Sahaba up until now. We have what we have between the ummah. But the Prophet asked, and Allah said, no. So never think that because you didn't get what you wanted, that your dua wasn't responded to because there's other ways of responding and never think that just because you didn't get what you asked for that you're a failure or a loser. No, your dua itself shows that you are a worshiper of Allah. And perhaps your highest state ever in life will be when you're struggling to have that dua answered and you're praying constantly to get what you want. Perhaps that state will be one of your best states and will cause your shafa'ah. Just like yani the tabi'i said that Allah Azza responded to him that, hey, I want to hear you. That's why I'm not answering your dua. Because your state right now was better than anything before and is going to be better than anything after. So during this time frame, I want you to be in the state because I myself am enjoying it. So never ever think that way Allah Azza wa Jal will give you what you want and inshallah in that struggle your iman is being proven to yourself and to Allah Azza wa Jal. Zakallah khair Shaykh, this is beautiful subhanAllah. Regarding the, the, uh, what Ibn, Ibn al-Jawzir was speaking about in, his, in terms of his, his own trial, uh, one of them I believe it was most uh, prominent in his life which we uh, spoke about at the beginning of uh, the series, uh, his biography, his son. Like, you know what, he is the most prolific author out there in the Muslim Ummah. He's, mashallah, the greatest, you know, preacher and speaker. You know, just subhanAllah, people, they repent when they hear his voice and this and that. Still, Allah subhanAllah tried him with one of his children. And he made a lot of dua for his guidance and it just didn't happen. For a hikmah and a wisdom, only Allah knows subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to uh, Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they themselves also, they said, qalu mata nasrullah. Where is, the, where is the, the victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised? What does that exactly mean? They'd be making dua, a lot of dua, a lot of dua, and then it's just like it wasn't happening, right? When the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bilal, Hubayb, and others, they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when they were still in Mecca, and he was resting in the shade of the Kaaba sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, almost like taking a nap. And this Sahaba looked at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a situation like this, and he's just taking a nap. What's going on here? So they said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah tad'u lana, Allah tastansa lana. Why don't you make dua for us? Why don't you ask Allah to give us victory? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just quietly, he just sat up and he just looked at them. He goes, look, the world before he went through a lot of hardships, way bigger than yours. And he mentioned two examples, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the point he said, look, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, he will fulfill his promise. He will fulfill his promise to you. But it's going to be on his terms, not your terms. So the same thing in your plan. Allah has a plan for you. He is going to make your, your, your life go on His terms. But He will guide you through subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, my personal yani, experience, subhanAllah, it's a, it's a, I don't know if I've ever actually mentioned this in public, yani, but it happens around 2012, 2012, 2013. It happened that my, my wife and, and the kids, they went actually to travel to Amman, Jordan, subhanAllah. They were supposed to come uh, at the end of the summer. But then, for a reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, um, uh, things got complicated, they were unable to come. And the problem with that, and the, the, the biggest issue was the uncertainty. How long are they going to stay there? So it was a day, two, a week, two, subhanAllah, say tomorrow after tomorrow, two more weeks, three more weeks, all that stuff. And subhanAllah, during that time, the kids came back, and my wife stayed behind, and then I had to be the mom and dad at the same time, and also finishing my master's degree, and doing all these kind of things, and being the Imam of Valley Ranch, all that stuff. Not so many people knew about what was going on. Actually. Some people didn't even know that my wife was absent. She was absent for more than 15 months, 16 months actually. During that time, I got really exhausted. Really, really exhausted. It's just, subhanAllah, you get to these moments sometimes, you're 
unable to, uh, uh, to continue. It's just like a moment where you feel broken. But that's when I realized, subhanAllah, that the sweetness of all this experience after, towards the end of it. The point is that I was making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy that they come and we reunite the family together and all the stuff and so on. And, and the kids at the time were still young, the oldest was 13 and, and 11 and, and 9. It was so hard, subhanAllah. So, Sheikh, what happened after all these 15, 16 months, that was it. I was really, really tired and exhausted. But subhanAllah, it was a Friday. And I was getting ready to give khutbah to Jum'ah in the old masjid there. I came into the masjid. For some reason, I felt so peaceful. It was just a moment of peace and tranquility. And I just prayed to rak'ah, waiting to go on the member to give the khutbah. And I sat down, and I'm listening to the people reciting the Quran, the humming of the recitation of the Quran. So beautiful, so peaceful. I raised my hand and said, my Lord, just show me a sign. Just show me a sign. I just want to know if I should stay longer, to wait longer, or if I should just pack up and go be with my family. I said, Ya Rabbi, I'm asking just for a sign. And then I went to give the khutbah, subhanAllah, and left. That Friday, I was so exhausted in the morning, I didn't read Surah Al-Kahf. So as I was going to pick up the kids from school, I'm driving the side of Surah Al-Kahf. And then I came to the story of Musa, السلام, and the last word I pronounced was the word Musa, and then my phone rang. I'm looking at the phone, just should I answer and finish my surah first? And uh, I don't know if the brother's here or not, but eventually I said, let me answer him. So I answered him, he goes, Chef, do you have a minute? I said, sure. I said, what is it? He goes, I had a dream. I said, okay. He goes, I saw Prophet Musa in my dream. I'm like, interesting. <laughs> I said, what is it about? He goes, Musa alayhi salam, he was looking at the dome at night and the stars were so beautiful and he pointed to the stars with his staff, and he started moving it, and the whole dome started moving and going around and swirling around with his movement. He said, what does that exactly mean? I said, Jazakallah khair. <laughs> he goes, why? He goes, I told him, this dream wasn't for you, wasn't for you it's for me. <laughs> he goes, no, seriously, he goes, seriously, I'm telling you, it was not for you, it was for me, thank you very much. Three days later, my wife actually was back home. SubhanAllah. I was just like, for me it was like unbelievable. I realized in that moment, when you come to this moment of absolute brokenness, when you realize that ultimately, no matter what you tried with people and this and that and so on, so when you realize you've exhausted all means to get your things done your way, he's gonna do it his way. And the sooner you come to this realization with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more peaceful your life is going to be, and the more you will reconcile with all these hardships and difficulties because it's just part of a journey. It's on his terms that things will be done. Wallahu Jazakumullah khair. I think very beautiful, mashallah, and I appreciate both of you um, being willing to be a bit personal with these things. SubhanAllah, I think, you know, one of the things that becomes so crucial for us is to understand that sometimes the greatest juhud, the greatest struggle, is actually when you don't find any answer whatsoever and it does not alleviate or it does not become uh, or, you know, lifted, it's not alleviated for you in this life. And you draw all the pictures and you put all the puzzle pieces together and it's still not working and you still do taslim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you still say Rabbi aslamt I'm good Ya Allah if this is what you've decreed I'm gonna wait till the day of judgment and I will be um, you know I'll, I'll, uh, I'll seek that reward from you then SubhanAllah and I was thinking you know uh, it's no secret with me I mean for me it was the loss of my mother Allah yarhamha 15 years ago and um, I've lived my entire life uh, through that tragedy and um, I think that for the first time in COVID, I started to feel a closeness to a lot of people because so many people started losing their parents, you know? So I used to kind of feel left out in that sense, right? Um, and one thing I always try to tell myself, and I'll say it particularly to those that have lost loved ones, I had an interesting reflection on Surah Yasin this year. You know, every time you read the Qur'an, something hits you for the first time and you go, whoa. And I had a very interesting 
reflection on Ya qawmi Bima li rabbi wa ja'alani min al-mukramin. The righteous man who is killed in Surah Yasin who says, if only my people knew, if only my people knew what my Lord has done for me and how my Lord has honored me. Now obviously this is speaking in the sense of, you know, to those that were hostile to him. And there are so many lessons that we often take in speaking about the da'wah, the care that the da'i, that the caller to Islam should have for the one that they're calling, right? If you don't love people, you can't give them da'wah. If you don't care about your students, you can't teach them. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are. And if you don't want people to be saved, you're not going to be able to save them. You, you can't. You can't be a da'i and not love the person that you're trying to save. Da'wah requires that empathy. And so we often talk about the lessons of empathy uh, from that, that it's empathy for people's akhirah, right? But my reflection this time, I was like, subhanAllah, how many of the righteous that have departed, that we grieve over, if they could talk to us, would say, what are you crying about? <laughs> so this idea of being self-centered a bit, you know, when we lose our loved ones, and there are so many different dimensions to this. There's the sending forth of a parent to the akhirah. There's sometimes the more difficult and then sending forth a spouse and sending forth a child, even. And subhanAllah, when we talk about the children and the people that lose children uh, and the pain of that, and you don't ask Allah for those tests. You do not ask Allah for those tests. Don't ask your Lord to test you. Ask your Lord for degrees. That's also part of taslim, by the way, is don't challenge Allah. Don't say, Ya Allah, I want this severe test so I can reach this maqam. No, no, no. Ask for the maqam. Don't ask for the bala. Let Allah test you as He sees fit. And you think about it, like, you know, I, we saw people in these last few years make dua next to their parents' bedside, and their parents died out in front of them. And that was a crisis for many of them. And subhanAllah, the, the, if those people that have gone away truly were accepted as shuhada, would they want to come back? Khayru min al-Abbas ajruka ba'da wallahu khayru min kad al-Abbas. As Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma says that uh, when his father passed away, Abbas radiallahu anhu passed away, and, and the man said to him, uh, the Bedouin man said to him, better for you than al-Abbas is the reward that you have now that, that he's been taken away from you, if you do proper sabr and ihtisab. If you do proper patience and, and seeking the reward. Wallahu khayru min kad al-Abbas. And by the way, if Al-Abbas has his Rabb now, is with his Lord now, the comfort that God offers is greater than the comfort that the son offers. When you send forth a child, dear brothers and sisters, and people leave behind children in this life hoping that they will you know, grow up and, and be an extension of their sadaqa jariya and things of that sort, you've sent forth a shafi'ah, you sent forth an intercessor that's waiting to enter you into Jannah. You know, whether it was a little fetus or a child, to take you into Jannah and take you into a Bayt, Baytul Hamd, a house called the House of Praise for the one who prays Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that hardship. When you send forth a parent, you spend the rest of your life on earth trying to live up to it, trying to be their extension, trying to, trying to be great sometimes for them even when you can't be great for yourself. You know, when you don't have the drive yourself for yourself to be, a, to, to be driven by wanting to do good for them, and it may be that those people that you've sent forth are enjoying their reward and you are enjoying a closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of it or the potential of a closeness to Allah that can join you with them in that reward. And then one day you pass away and we're sitting here in the masjid or you're sitting here in the masjid after I'm gone or when we're gone and those that have passed away are saying, if only those people of your see knew. If only that brother I used to pray next to knew. If only that sister I used to pray next to knew. If only they knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me. And so again, you can't do this. You cannot come to terms with unanswered du'as unless you believe in a better place that they're answered. And that place is the akhirah. That's where we seek this reward. We don't do all this for dunya. We do all this for akhirah. You, you have to have that mindset. Once you start mixing up the two goals, your du'a will lose potency. You'll grow in resentment rather than closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your faith will suffer. But when you put the akhirah as your place of jaza, as your place of reward, and what Allah gives you of this dunya, you say alhamdulillah for it along the way, Allah you khaffifu ankum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making, making it a little bit easier for you along the way. All these gifts, the gifts of each other, honestly, the gifts of companionship, the gifts of each other, all these gifts, alhamdulillah. But 
Look for the Akhirah as the place of your jaza, as the place of your rewards. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa qina adhab al nar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the best of this life and the best of the next and protect us from the fire. And I want to specifically make dua for, for two people, Dr. Jamal Badawi, hafidhullah ta'ala, who's, who's ill. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Dr. Jamal is, our, is a pioneer for us and we owe it to him. Uh, any effort that comes out, there's a, a, a share of it that we can attribute to Dr. Jamal Badawi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him shifa, and cure him, and preserve him and reward him and expiate his sins. And also uh, Sister Durriya, the mother of uh, Sheikh Yasser Fahmi, Dr. Daria Fahmi, who is very ill right now, very sick and, and is in a very serious situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her full shifa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow her to pass through these critical moments with shifa. And may Allah azza wa jalla grant her and her family the reward and the ease. Allahumma ameen. And Shaykh Yusuf Bakir, our own subhanAllah over here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him full shifa and return him back to us and give him the full reward of these nights that he sought. Allahumma ameen. Uh, I think we'll take questions now, inshallah. Where's the microphone, Jamal? Oh, Sheikh Yasser Khan. So. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's it going? So, um, that book of Dua that you mentioned, it was a very tough time for you to uh, write that book, and you were focusing about, you know, like, it was a very hard part, part of your life. Uh, how do you manage time to write the book and to, you know, give it your all to get that book? And Masharat wa has rewarded you so much with, you know, your, it's, your, it's your best seller, which means has given you a lot of risk. So, you know, that hardship in, in the long term gave you a lot of risk and a lot of benefit. And that's pretty much, and also the, the Eid Salah, that Eid Salah you, you mentioned in the South Fork Ranch, so it's only going to be one. You're going to be the speaker? <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to announce the Eid Salah here at BRIC? I don't know. This is a halal competition, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, inshallah, it won't rain, inshallah. We're making dua. We're making dua this whole week. We're making dua. It won't rain, inshallah. So Dallas is going to see, inshallah, the biggest, the grandest, the most epic Eid that has ever seen. The most epic Eid that has ever seen. <laughs> Can, can you answer the dua question? <laughs> and it is open for all Ahl Dallas, in fact, all Ahl Texas, in fact, all Ahl Alam, whoever wants to come at South Fork Ranch. Inshallah, it will be taking place uh, 9.30 on the day of Eid, uh, on Monday. Uh, and of course, South Fork Ranch is, of course, the famous ranch where the famous series Dallas itself was filmed. Not that I would know anything about that or who J.R. is, who killed him. I don't know any of that stuff. But I mean, that's where it was filmed, so it's a historic moment as well inshallah that frankly it is iconic and the fact we're we'll, going to have maybe 10,000 we'll Muslims coming inshallah so. anyone who goes don't come back I stop <laughs> that was that's harsh man no no that's a joke <laughs> What's the we won't inshallah. say welcome home again we'll say <laughs> don't worry, we won't tell anybody don't worry just come bismillah alhamdulillah plus we'll have rides and carnivals and everything anyway alhamdulillah so that was your second question and, and it, yes I will be uh, um, I've been scheduled to give the, the khutbah his dua was answered, I guess, yeah. 9.30, inshallah, on Monday. See you all there, inshallah. As for your first question, subhanAllah, um, I, I found the book therapeutic. It was a very tense time of my life. As I said, Allah has blessed me to be almost uh, five decades now, subhanAllah. Honestly, that time frame was one of the most stressful times of my life for multiple reasons. Uh, my wife was nine months at that time with my eldest and it was, you know, financially it was just a very difficult time overall visa situation, uncertainty subhanAllah, it was just overall so many things happening so the book was my therapy writing the book was therapeutic and I put my heart and soul into that book really, so that's why I think anybody who reads it, they feel it's in there because I felt it. I've never been as emotionally invested. Alhamdulillah, I have what, almost a dozen, more than a dozen. So this book was the one that it just, it really overtook my own life. And I was doing nothing other than this because otherwise my mind, it's different. We're all human beings, man. Very, it's, things are traumatic. Doesn't matter how much your ilm or hibl or whatever. When a trauma happens, it hurts. It really does. And we are humans. We're flesh and blood. All of us here, anybody you see, we're all flesh and blood. And when things happen that are difficult, our lives are affected, our mentalities are affected, you know. So I found the book, My Therapy, and that's why it kind of, you know, alleviated some of the stress. And then Alhamdulillah, what happened, happened, inshallah. So I hope that answers your question, inshallah.
My sisters have a question. recently discovered Tessa Wolf, and I've come across different perspectives on this topic. I wanted to hear what you think and know about this. So her question was about uh, Tessa Wolf. She said she recently discovered Tessa Wolf, and it gave her some different perspective on this topic. It's a wide, it, it's one of those, those branches and words that obviously has such a wide connotation to it, and the, the way that we respond is there is, that which is grounded, the spirituality that is grounded in the tradition that doesn't exceed the bounds. And you'll find even the author himself uh, delineate between the praiseworthy and that which isn't praiseworthy and, and, the praise, and, and that which obviously is, is a, means of, a means of spiritual purification and bringing us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes blameworthy when either the practices exceed what we learn from our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the ideas themselves. Uh, start to guide uh, the practices away from that. And so, uh, obviously, again, I think that when we're talking about these types of, of discussions and dua, I mean, there is an element of that spirituality and that pursuit of spirituality and the methodology of that. And spirituality is certainly not random. It has tools, it has mechanics, we have uh, tradition that we lean into, we have scholars that we look to. Uh, but we're always guided sort of by that original uh, revelation in that sense. Wallah. Uh, just a quick uh, um, free plug in, inshallah. I have a 30 minute lecture online in my uh, Q&A, number 141, regarding Sufism, which is a bit of an academic talk. Uh, and it is a very, inshallah, neutral, um, where I try to explain what is the soul of Sufism. So you can listen, that's online, it's on YouTube. So you just Google my name, uh, and then regarding Sufism, and it's uh, Ash Sheikh YQ, number 141 episode. And if I can ask, just as the questions are, are still, we only have about 14 minutes, so please keep it to the topic, inshallah. So whoever has a question, make sure your question's about the subject, inshallah ta'ala, of unanswered du'as, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum, sorry, Kassi. Is it normal to feel a lack of entitlement to ask Allah for things sometimes? Like, sometimes I feel like I'm asking Him for so many things that it comes off a little greedy, or... I'm not thankful for the blessings that I've been giving, so I dedicate some time to be thankful during dua to the blessings that I have. How important is it to do that, and is it normal to feel that way sometimes? So there, there's multiple angles of this. Firstly, at one level, it is healthy to feel this if it's done properly, but at another level, it is a mistake, and I'll explain, okay? It's healthy to feel this in the sense that you should, all of us should feel that Allah Azza wa Jal has given us so much and we haven't thanked Him for what we're giving, what we have been given, yet we're asking for more. So there is an element of shyness and that's good. That's good that you understand that, you know what, I already have so much and I haven't been thankful enough and I want more. That having been said, we should never stop asking. So the shyness should remain there, but we constantly will continue to ask because what is the alternative? Who else are you going to ask? You must ask because you are a created being that has la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. You can do nothing and I can do nothing, right? We must ask because we are completely helpless without Allah. And so, when the Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Abu Dawood, not a single dua that you make except that Allah will give you either something of this world or avert a, cry, a, a calamity or give you something in the akhirah. The Sahabi said, Ya Rasulullah, if that is the case, we will ask Allah for even more. إِذَا nastakthir, Right? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, he smiled and he said, Allahu Akbar. Allah is much more than what you can ask for. Allah is much more than what you can ask for, right? And remember the famous hadith, Qudsi, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, uh, that Allah says that if all of the creation gathered simultaneously and asked me all of their needs that they can possibly imagine, and I gave them every single dua that they asked me to, it would not diminish my dominion except like the needle dipped into the ocean, diminishes the ocean. So when you're asking somebody who has the treasures of the heavens and earth, 
When you're asking somebody who is al kareem then don't be shy. Go ahead and ask. Don't be shy because of him. Be shy because of you, as I said. And also remember this, that you not asking means nothing. Your existence is contingent on Allah giving you existence. Your breath, your sip of water, it is Allah giving it to you, whether you ask or not. So don't link your what you have with Allah, with your asking Allah. Because Allah Azza wa Jal is giving even if you don't ask. Allah is giving even, so your asking is only a manifestation of your ubudiyah. That's all that it is, right? Therefore, you continue to ask because it is going back to the 3D that I mentioned, right? And our mother Aisha said, uh, it's also reported as a hadith, but this not as a hadith, it's actually mawquf on our mother Aisha, or, or that Aisha radiallahu anha said that if your shoelace breaks, then make dua to Allah that you're blessed with a new shoelace. Because unless Allah gives you a shoelace, you ain't gonna get a shoelace. There is no such thing as a trivial dua. So you feel embarrassed, not because you're asking Allah, but because you haven't done your haqq, but you still ask. And this goes back to the psychology you talked about, the three dimension, right? The haya comes from yourself. And by the way, Allah himself is al hayy Allah himself has haya when you make dua. Again, hadith is in Abu Dawood. That the Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna Allah hayyun kareemun yastahyi min abdihi." Allah is shy. Allah has bashfulness. Allah has a modesty that is befitting Him, and Allah is generous. Allah is bashful that when His servants raise His hands up to Him asking something, that He allows those hands to come back sifra with zero. The word zero comes from sifra, sifra with nothing in them. Allah is hayy. So go ahead and feel a sense of. I, I, I know I don't deserve this, O oh Allah, but then say, but O oh Allah, I need it because you are the Rabb and I am the Abd. O oh Allah, you are my Mawla. O oh Allah, there is no Ilah to call besides you. O oh Allah, there is no Rabb other than you. If I don't ask you, who am I going to ask? So yes, you feel that embarrassment and then you continue to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, if I want to add one more thing, actually the dua of uh, the story of Ayub alayhi salam. With all the tests that he had to go through, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved him from that test eventually. And he gave him everything back. He gave him his family, his wealth, his life, and everything. He got everything, alayhi salatu was salam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent upon him gold, raining, basically. So what did he do? He grabbed his stove, and he started collecting all that gold in his stove. Like collecting more of it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to Ayyub, Qala ya Ayyub, ala mawnika an hadha? Did not give you enough that you don't need this anymore? He goes, yes, my Lord, you did. I can never have enough of your uh, bounties. So when it comes to the subject of greed, it's a wrong perception when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We think what we're asking is too much. But uh, that's even a wrong concept because with Allah subhanahu wa there's no such thing as too much really. Whatever you ask is absolutely nothing. So keep asking, there is no such thing. But however, just like Shaykh Hazza was talking about, don't forget to be grateful as well too. Always show your thanks. Uh, and your servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Allah khair. We'll take probably one more question from the sisters, inshallah, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Bismillah. As salamu alaykum. Sheikh Yasser Qadi, I really loved your description of the, the different dimensions of dua and how in the third dimension of dua, a person in a state of such need and such desperation, they, they create that relationship. They, be, they become so close to Allah. After they're answered and they enter a sort of period of ease and in their life, how do they maintain that closeness with Allah when you're in that period of ease? And that is why Ibn al-Qayyim says that the righteous person understands that when the dua is answered, they're going to lose that connection. And so deep down inside, even as they're saying, oh Allah, I want, I want, their heart is saying, yeah, but not yet, just keep on delaying. Because their heart begins to become addicted to the love of Allah, to the relationship, the conversation, right? That closeness that you feel at that time of need, you know you're not going to feel it when there is no need, right? So at some level, you understand that's going to happen. At another level, you try to make up for it. You make up for it by being grateful. And how is gratitude shown? Generally speaking, gratitude is shown by being in a better state after you get what you want than you were before you had it, okay? So being in a better spiritual state, having extra ibadat, having extra charity, having extra, you know, nafir or tahajjud or dhikr or whatnot. You demonstrate to Allah that you appreciate because we don't want to be like 
half a dozen verses in the Quran that Allah says the Qufar of Quraysh or those that are you know uh, not worshiping Allah properly Allah describes their state that uh, when they're in a, a, a time of need they make dua purely ikhlas right they're making dua standing sitting and lying down then when Allah responds to their dua yakfurun yakfurun here doesn't mean they reject Allah yakfurun here means they become ungrateful okay we don't want to be like those people how do we not be like those people as I said perhaps and realistically you might lose that hal that you had with Allah but then you make up in other ways and as I said the main thing to do is that and this is by the way the general rule of thumb uh, that anytime a good deed happens anytime you go for Hajj let's say Ramadan anytime a blessing happens that you should be better post blessing than you were pre blessing because Allah says in the Quran innama yataqabbalullahu min al-muttaqin Allah accepts from the people of taqwa so if Allah has accepted your Hajj Allah has accepted your Ramadan Allah has accepted your dua that means inshallah inshallah you've done some taqwa aspect so then you need to demonstrate that taqwa by actually having a different lifestyle so this is inshallah in a nutshell wallahu a'lam jazakallah khair inshallah ta'ala will wrap up um jazakallah khair shaykh yasser for coming by we appreciate it and we uh alhamdulillah i mean i think one of the beautiful things obviously is is just the uh, the, the closeness with the of our communities and and we've been having a lot of that that ta'awun and working together with the night time so we pray for the the brotherhood to increase between our communities uh, how many of you have been to Epic before, by the way? Raise your hands. Okay. How, how many, many of you have not been to Epic? Uh, one or two. Khalas, mashallah, this week, inshallah. And I'll see all of you for Epic Eid, inshallah. You, you, anyway, must, be, so. you must be tired. That was about 40 people. In, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, how many of you like Epic more than VRC? Astaghfirullah, guys. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got that, some that's three Epic. people. That's three, yeah. <laughs> how many of you are from Epic? So there are more Masha people Allah. from Epic Alhamdulillah. than those who raise their hand for liking Epic more than VRC. So. Guys, you just, just embarrassed I mean, us, man. What are you doing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll have a conversation afterwards. Allah okay. Allah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make dua for you. And you know, we, 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 I'm just going to put this out there. For our Eid Salah, for our Eid Salah, we're going to be doing one Eid Salah. Sheikh Yasser Burjas and I are going to tag team. One's going to lead Salah, one's going to give khutbah. So. So uh, you, get, you get a two-for-one deal here. <laughs> and um, we won't be that mad at you if you go to, to, the, to their Eid Salah, but we, uh, we hope, inshallah ta'ala, that we can continue to do things to increase the bonds between uh, our communities within the Eid the brotherhood, the sisterhood. It's a time for that. It is a time for that. So it's very, it should be noted that the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the one thing was that he wanted unity, alayhi salatu was salam. And Allah Azza wa Jal has entrusted us with that mujahada as well, that we strive and we struggle to unite our ranks to unite our hearts and that is a favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I, I want you to, to take that with you inshallah those that are watching online those that are here you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, remember the favor of Allah upon you when you were enemies and Allah is the one who brought you together and so you became once again by his blessing he mentioned it was only his ni'mah twice you were brothers. So may Allah make us brothers and sisters. Amen. Those of us that are here across the Masajid, across the globe, may Allah always allow us to see each other as brothers and sisters Amen. and to grow together in that which is pleasing to Him. May He give us the foundation of this revelation in our hearts, in our lives, in our ethics, in our institutions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to do the work of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam long after, after he has uh, left us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of the mashayikh, all of the institutions, all of the masajid uh, that are working together. And may Allah azza wa jalla allow us to catch Laylatul Qadr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on our loved ones who have passed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure our loved ones who are ailing, the ones that we named and the ones that we have not named. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us all. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah wa khayran. Inshallah ta'ala tomorrow we'll continue with, with actually talking about al-bala. So we're going to continue on the, the notion of hardships. And another very beautiful chapter. May Allah reward Imam Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala. Waladahu al-Mukhallad. His immortal child still amongst us in this book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. And we got to hear about your uh, bidnillahi ta'ala. Waladuk al-Mukhallad bidnillahi ta'ala. Your immortal child in the dua book. May Allah azza wa jal accept it from you, Shaykh. I'm going to do what Shaykh Yasser Rajas always uh, does, which is please allow the Mashaykh to proceed, inshallah ta'ala, and enjoy 30 minutes with the Nahi Ta'ala to themselves, and then at 3 o'clock we will start our Qiyam. Shaykh Yasser, with a big smile on your face, can you tell everyone to leave us alone?
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله